Hi, Bianca. It's really lovely to have you um, on board today. So I'm speaking to Bianca Colclough from This Girl Community. Um, Bianca has created this amazing community for women to share and be part of and to support them. I really love the ethos around everything that you do with This Girl, Bianca. So before we get started, just want to tell me a little bit about This Girl so that all the viewers can understand what you do. Yeah, of course. So um, I created this girl as a brand pu purely because uh, I felt that over my career over the last 20 years as a business professional in the corporate space, there were a lot of women who lived a life with very successful careers, family. Um, I never actually felt that I knew them. Um, they were women who sort of created a, a filtered version of themselves in the workplace in fear of um, appearing lesser than a male partner, um, a male manager, you know, so they, they were almost creating a caricature of themselves in the workplace. Um, as my life progressed, I decided that the time was right for me to talk more openly about some of the significant traumas and events that had happened in my life that had shaped and defined the person that I've become. Um, as I went through that journey in my 30s, um, I decided that it was actually time for me to share this. Um, and in doing that, I realised that there were actually a lot of women, and I mean a lot of women, who were just like me. So yeah. women wore a mask, um, were very good at what they did, were confident in themselves as women and, you know, portrayed a perfect life, a perfect family, social media was always great. But actually underneath all that, they needed further support. Mm. So my question was, well, where do these women go? Because they're, they're almost too proud to go and go to their GP and say, I'm suffering with mental health issues or depression. Um, so I decided to create a non-clinical community where women could have a voice. They could talk openly about anything really without judgment, without filter, without any form of um, judgment to just be themselves, yeah. talk about issues that they share in their lives, share their stories if they wanted to. Um, and in doing so, I have created such an amazing community of women from all corners of the country who have ultimately been given an opportunity via my platform to meet other women who are just like them but all have a story and that's exactly where my mantra comes from this girl has a story but let's start with yours yeah um, the power of that for me is really important because it doesn't matter what my story is I want to hear yours but then let's talk about how we can support each other through our own experiences and, and that's ultimately yeah. the message behind the brand yeah, and I, I love that. And that's why we wanted you to be part of Switch It Up, really, mm -hmm. and to speak to you for that, because, you know, Switch It Up is all about women's health and getting the women's health agenda, you know, it, the, the voice that is needed. We need to raise this up now and get awareness there. And obviously, you've created this wonderful safe space for people mm -hmm. to, to come along and share their stories. But, I mean, you, you mentioned there that you, you've been through some trauma in your lifetime. And the reason that we're here to talk to you today is because you've, you've become a mother in later life, as it were, <laughs> yeah. in the nicest way. But also, I want, could you give us a little bit of um, an oversight of some of the, the experiences you've had in your life and, and why, you know, becoming a mother at this time of life has been quite a challenge as well, please? Yeah, absolutely. Very time. I've always been very um, open since I decided to share my story. So um, unfortunately, from the age of six, I, I was victim of sexual abuse. Mm. Um, so um, that was a family trauma and a family secret that was decided that nobody would talk about, which the knock on effects of that for me as a young child was that keeping that to yourself for 28 years and not being encouraged to talk about it in fear of retribution, in fear of being judged or, or you know, any of those things mm. will naturally have its effect on you, you know, and, and when I did eventually get the counselling I needed the analogy that was used was so perfect for my situation it was like imagine a bottle of pop and throughout your life that bottle gets fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller and one day something will make that top come off and the, the bottle will explode because it's been shook so many times yeah. and that's exactly what happened to me so the reason that I decided to speak out about my childhood traumas wasn't actually because of my traumas it was something else that had caused that bottle to um to explode and that unfortunately was the breakdown of my marriage 
Um, now, during the breakdown of my marriage, I had experienced two miscarriages. Um, and as I was very aware, as a lot of women are, you get into the point in your life where you stop thinking that you want children and you start thinking that you can't because A, you get into a certain point in your life that ages, you know, as family very uh, innocently say, you know, not realising the effects. So, you know, you're getting on a bit, Bianca, you're getting on a bit. Well, I, yes, I know that you don't need to keep reminding me, you know, but I it just kind of created a shell around myself that I was never going to be a mum. And yeah. I don't think that was because... I didn't want to be, but to the outside world, it was easier for me to pretend I didn't want children rather than have to keep facing the conversation of why are you in your 30s? Why are all my friends having children and I haven't? Um, and I now realise, and I'm at peace with that, that a lot of that is because of my childhood trauma. Yeah. My mindset had been shifted that anything to do with children, I was scared of. I was scared of... Um, revisiting those horrible memories or you know all the things that I, I now understand are part and parcel of the DNA that's created me as a woman as yeah. I am today so yeah I, after this happened um I launched this girl as a business last year and um literally within two weeks of launching the business I found out I was pregnant <laughs> um, so obviously if I can be completely honest as I always am um for the first 12 weeks of that pregnancy, I just didn't expect it to go any further. I'd almost put that armour back up that I'd been, you know, kind of contradicting myself with what this girl community is all about, being open. Suddenly I was retreating back into that old Bianca of putting a shell around me and saying, well, yeah, I'm pregnant, but I'm going to lose it anyway because I've lost two babies already. I'm nearly 40. I'm not going to be able to have a baby. And that was my safe zone. Yeah. So that I was protecting my emotions so that if I was unfortunate to miscarry again, well, hey, I expected it was going to happen anyway. Yeah. So it's almost my, my defence mechanism. So 12 weeks went by, 20 weeks went by, 26 weeks went by. And then suddenly I started to really enjoy what was going to happen. And I stopped thinking negatively about this amazing experience that I was having. Um, and... I started to really enjoy it, you know, and I stand by what I say that I absolutely loved being pregnant. Yeah. Um, you know, I think as an older woman, um, I guess there's a stigma that you're having a baby at 40, you know, has it been through IVF, you know, and, and no, I naturally conceived, it was a, a naturally conceived baby and he's completely healthy and fine, you know, so the, there is naturally the worries that he may have down syndrome you know I appreciate and I've researched vastly you know the the concerns that are raised as what the doctors class me as a geriatric mum yes I, <laughs> you know it's such a horrible it's, term isn't it's it it's, it's awful. horrible yeah it's awful but yeah so when um as I was going to the scans you know and I kept seeing him growing and I'm getting those little pops of joy where they're saying yeah he's fine he's healthy he's he, everything's okay your mindset starts to shift and you start to enjoy the experience. Um, I guess one of the biggest challenges of it all was that I decided in my 40 years of existence that I was going to have a baby amidst a global pandemic. <laughs> so, <laughs> Don't good plan for that one. <laughs> so, no, I mean, I certainly couldn't have planned getting pregnant two weeks after launching my business, and I certainly couldn't have planned the same year being the one that there was a global pan pandemic. So, do you know what? A lot of people have said, now, how did you cope with having uh, being pregnant during the pandemic? I actually loved it, Verity, because it forced me to slow down. I yeah. didn't have to go to a place of work every day. Obviously, I'd chosen to work for myself anyway, which was a, a blessing and a worry in both measures for different reasons. But it meant that me and my partner and my stepson could enjoy being at home and enjoying being pregnant, you know, and all of the things that I didn't know went with it, but all of the things that did go with it. Yeah. So, uh, okay, we, we had a horrendous year last year, but I actually took that time to clear my headspace, finish my counselling at home without, you know, having to travel yeah. anywhere to go to it. It was all done via Zoom. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's... that's um, 
Oh. Yeah, you, you, you've touched on a couple of things there. Um, first, you mentioned, obviously, about miscarriage. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that that's perceived now? I mean, is, is there still that kind of stigma and, and, and weight attached to being a lady that miscarriages, do you think? Um, I, one of the, um, I think one of the things I really sh have struggled with, Verity, and I know that you and I have spoken about this before, is that... I have no experience of children at all. So um, my family don't have any or many children in the family. Um, you know, my, my siblings, you know, I, I don't have a relationship with certain family members because of me talking about what happened with my trauma. Um, I guess I would have expected that anyway. So anything to do with children to me was completely alien. Um, so being pregnant and having a miscarriage in, in the space of five years, two miscarriages and a pregnancy that, that went full term. I don't have any knowledge or understanding of any of it. So when I um, had my first miscarriage, I was actually only six weeks in. I say only, I mean, obviously it's still traumatic, but I guess it kind of hadn't set, even got set it into my head what yeah. was going on. But my second miscarriage was at 12 weeks. Mm. So I'd already been to a scan at that point and I'd seen, oh, I always say it was a little girl and I, 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 seen, I seen what was of her on the screen, you know, and the emotion with that was quite different because it kind of made me think, oh, I actually do want a baby. Mm. I, I do, you know, and I'd seen this little thing on the screen and, and I kind of thought, wow, you know, I, am I actually going to be a mum? Because 12 weeks of something living inside you is a long time. Yeah. And then... To suddenly be told that's gone, yeah, and which is what happened when I went for the scan. They said they couldn't find a heartbeat. I left the hospital and I was like, oh, well, I was never going to have a baby anyway. You know, I wouldn't yeah. have expected it to go full term because of my age. Nobody followed that up with me. Nobody yeah. asked me if I needed any kind of mental health support. Why? Um, there was no um explanation about what would happen after I'd had a miscarriage and I certainly yeah. don't want to go along the horror movie route yeah. because you know I, I appreciate your, your viewers but it was extremely traumatic yeah. Um, yeah. and it, I never ever anticipated what was going to leave my body um yeah. excuse the frankness but I guess it's yeah, real yeah. life um it it was absolutely traumatic and I was hospitalised because of it um, and, and because of, my body just couldn't cope with, with the no. loss of blood. You know, obviously I collapsed. I had um, issues. I got taken in an ambulance to the hospital. Who told me this was going to happen? Nobody. No. And that's that's the thing, isn't it? I think, you know, we've got to make sure that this is, is you're educated in that situation yes. because it just makes something that is already really traumatic even mm. worse. And then not having any support after that. Were you employed at the time or were you self-employed? I just wondered what, how you were. Yeah, I was yeah. employed at the and, time. And how so. was that as, as an employee in a workplace? Did you um, get support at work? I work for an absolutely fantastic company, you know, mm. and it's a company I'm still very close to the, the director there. You know, we, we see him, speak to him regularly. He's an amazing support, not only for, for us as a, as a family, but for, you know, for, he's yeah. created a lifestyle for us over the, over the few years. And when I decided to work for myself, um, he's very much still part of our, of what we do, you know, so he's, um, I imagine that life could have been very different if I'd have been working for organisations I've worked for in the past. Right, okay, um, yeah. Because of things I'd witnessed, um, comments that have been made in the workplace, you know, about, um, oh gosh, don't, you know, don't get pregnant, we need you here, kind of okay, thing. You know, yeah. Um, psychological things that are implanted in women's heads that I since have found out is not wasn't just me I've had lots of women come to me and say they felt almost as if they should feel um worried if they get pregnant because yeah. their place of work is going to be diminished and you know and they're not going to be um wanted to be kept on because they they're going to take yeah. maternity leave and all which, which is crazy in this day and age isn't it when you think 51 yeah. percent of the workforce are women or so exactly. you know yeah the other point I'd really like to talk on is, and we both laughed about it when you said it, but 
the term geriatric mother, because I know yes. with my last daughter, I was 35 when I had her, mm -hmm. and I've got three children, mm -hmm. and I was termed a geriatric mother at that age, which, which is, is it's such a vile term, actually. It's almost derogatory, isn't it? I am going to shut it. Okay. There we go. Sorry. Um, how did that make you feel already in a very, I know you, you said, you know, you haven't got those female supportive roles in your life mm -hmm. like most of us do with mothers or, or grandmothers and that kind of thing. Then to be termed <laughs> geriatric, I mean, was that, did that have an effect on you or were you just okay with that? Um, it's a funny one that I've pondered myself, Verity, a few mm. times and I think one of the things that I've always lived a very clean life, you know, I meditate, I've done yoga from a very young age, and I know in myself, I'm fit and healthy for the age that I am. So I suppose from, again, putting that protective bubble on myself, I knew that if I was able to carry a baby full term, he would be fine, because I, I, I know that I live a life where I would do my every best you know I know of women in their 20s who have had babies that have smoked oh, through their yeah. pregnancy that were already classed as um, a higher BMI or overweight when they've had babies so there's there's certain risks associated with that yeah. um, I guess as far as the older mums concerned I think it's more a perception of society less than the effect it had on me okay. um, I think not I was pregnant or I've had my baby that I felt myself having to justify or I think I mentioned earlier people saying oh have you had him by your IVF yeah like, well, no I haven't you know and those are the things for me that mean that it's more of a society issue yeah um, it could certainly affect women more than it affected me but I yeah. think the that the, the NHS use is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Like, you know, it's outdated, women, isn't it? I mean, especially as more women are having children later exactly, in life as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I know you made some, we've, we've obviously spoken about this already, but you made some decisions when you had Ezra, who I met you when Ezra was four weeks old. I can't believe yes. that. How old is he now? Uh, four months. Four, four months. months. Bless yeah. you. I feel like yeah. I've known you forever, but it's really quite yeah, a short yeah, time. It's, it's dark. Crazy, crazy. <laughs> But um, I know, obviously, you um, elected to have a cesarean, didn't you? And did, yeah. Um, yeah. and also you elected to bottle feed, which yes. is every woman's yeah. right. But, you know, mm -hmm. that's in itself has presented you with some kind of uh, what well, challenges or people have kind of opposed that view, haven't mm -hmm. they? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd say of, of everything that I've experienced since becoming a mum, um, or leading up to the point of becoming one, that's probably what has affected my personal well-being the most. Yeah. But, uh, I have been asked repeatedly by um, clinical professionals, doctors, nurses, um, healthcare visitors, midwife, people within a network that I've known, why have you had an elected caesarean? in that tone or can I ask why you chose to have an elective cesarean well and what I found myself doing is giving them an answer that was sugar-coated mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to say because it's my choice it's absolutely none of your business why I chose to have one until um I actually that bottle went off again um and I had my six week checkup call with my health visitor um, through the doctors because she actually rang me because of the pandemic, I wasn't allowed to yeah. go in. Um, and she wanted to run through a series of questions with me. Um, and I remember the day very clearly, obviously I was still recovering from, from my op and I was upstairs in the house and she rang me and she said, I just want to run through a few things with you, Bianca. And her tone was quite curt with me during mm. If there wasn't the warm feeling I'd got from some of the other people and she said um first question how are you feeling and I was like I'm I'm fine thank you you know everything's healing okay and you know I'm checking my wound every day doing everything I was supposed to be doing even though I didn't know a lot of this I was happy to research it myself because of the pandemic um and she said um can I ask why you've had an elective cesarean and do you know what, Verity, that was the last time somebody asked me. I'd absolutely had enough. And I said to her, have you not read my notes? Do you not 
read my notes before you call me and I could hear her shuffling away you know trying to find the notes because she realized that there was obviously something in there that she should have read that she yeah. hadn't um and she was like oh oh no 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 well it's just protocol I just asked I said well had you have looked at the notes before contacting me you would know that I've been a victim of sexual abuse and there are very very harsh memories that are inflicted back on me with the prospect of having a natural birth the fact of having um you know things around around me you know and and people lots of people in a room I said I can't go down that route I said but I just want to let you know one thing so thank you very much so do you want to return back to that first question how am I feeling because you have made me feel really really uncomfortable for Mm. asking the next time maybe you should actually read people's notes before asking such a question I said because it's my and I think it was just the fact that so many people had asked me this question and she got the wrath of it. She wasn't asking me anything any different than other people. Yeah. But I don't ask women why they have a natural birth. You no. know, what, am I allowed to ask that? No, why would I ask? Because it's your choice, your body. And that was the moment I thought, that's the last time someone asks me that question and I shall coat it because I am absolutely sick of it. And that is massively, for me, something that society needs to look at yeah yeah why appropriate just like many other you know why are there why is it acceptable to say something to someone and not to someone else why is it acceptable for somebody to ask why I've had an elective cesarean but I'm it's not acceptable for me to go oh you had a natural birth oh I wouldn't do it so um yeah I, I just found that defining moment rather uplifting for me because I felt I'd finally been able to give the real reason yeah. um, but also it really put in a, in a jar for me just how poor people's approach is particularly within a professional capacity the ins the the fact that she was just not sensitive to the reason why and it was almost like she was looking down on me because I'd chosen to have that procedure yeah. um, at the end of the day he's healthy he was seven pound fourteen. He was born exactly as he was supposed to do. He was, he is, and still is. Touchwood, a perfectly healthy little boy. How does it matter how he was delivered? Absolutely, I think you're completely right. And I mean, I, I, I felt that stigma and that that expectation as well as a, as a mum with breastfeeding, um, mm. because I just, I just, I tried. I didn't get on with it. I hated it. I would have rather have left my baby crying in a cot at the end of the bed then picked it up to feed it and the Mm. midwife was very much well you sure you don't want to try again Mm. and it wasn't until my third baby where I just went I'm not doing this I'm not even going to try this time I've got too much on I'm too busy and it's like you say it should be our decision it's our bodies absolutely and I think you know what one of the things I probably did underestimate from having a c-section is the recovery is a lot worse than I thought. Yes. I think, you know, at my stigma and, you know, my misjudgment, wrongly, I should have done more research, is that women who do have a natural birth have what I would perceive to be a horrendous time. You know, there must be so much pain involved. I've watched one born every minute religiously oh. throughout that whole pregnancy and the Emma Willis delivering babies. I've seen it from every angle. And I think... I thought that when I had a C-section, I'd be stitched up, everything would be fine, and, you know, uh, within a few weeks I'd be healed and back back on my feet. I never anticipated just how bad the recovery is, Mm. and I still, my my stomach is completely numb, Um, I still get pains if I'm, you know, okay, I'm four months into recovery now, and I've been, um, I drive, you know, I do all the normal household things I'm supposed to, but, oh my God, like, sometimes that how well wow and I don't think I expected the level you know cut the seven layers that they get through to get to to Ezra I was like oh my god I didn't know anything yes of course I couldn't feel anything on the on the operating table but I've spoke a lot about that whole journey from when I went into theatre right the way through to being in recovery where my the bottom of my my legs were paralyzed and I Mm. I annoying it was when you can't feel your legs and you're waiting for that feeling to come back no one told me this and this isn't this it's crazy isn't it as women you know we get every woman will give me not every woman will give birth but every woman that has given birth and some have had to have cesareans emergencies some will have had elective like yourself 
why don't we talk? Because, you know, we, it's renowned that women are good at talking about these things, but mm -hmm. there are still certain things that we just don't talk about. No, you know, that, no, not at all. No. And that's what I think that's what we're really trying to do with with Switch It Up is get yeah. that kind of conversation going because like, I wouldn't have known that. I, I mm -hmm. wouldn't have had a clue because I, I had natural births, but yeah. I wouldn't have necessarily, you know, researched it ahead of either if I was told you were going to have to have a, a cesarean, you know. Yeah, it's almost the, the opinion that the natural birth is the, the the big one, you know, the pain and everything. And then a C-section is almost the, the easy way out. And that, of, of course, I can never compare because I am not gone through the, the first, you know, and, and I think, you know, for, for women I know that have had that experience, I know how painful and how horrendous it can be, particularly when it's a long pain yeah. state birth I'm not comparing the two at all but my experience I was ill prepared I didn't know other than going into theatre having the epidural you know I, I'd watched so many videos on YouTube of what that was because I'm thinking yeah. what you're having an injection in your spine and you're ultimately paralyzed from the waist down wow what does that mean and yeah. but until you're actually sat in recovery and you cannot physically move the bottom half of your body and you're being forced to move you're not allowed to go back to the ward until you can physically move again it's like oh i can't oh, move it was an annoying thing you know but yeah no one told me this no. and it doesn't matter because obviously it's part of the recovery and i've got little one there yeah. next to me but people just don't talk don't. about these things and the only other thing I wanted to add which I, I know I, I did write a blog on recently and I got such a huge um audience and, and a lot of feedback on it is as a as a woman who has zero experience of children being around them knowing what to do with them one of the things I found most shocking for me was when I went back up to the ward um my partner had had to go home because of the pandemic so he wasn't able to share that experience with me yeah. which is really sad so I was literally on my own and it was about half past 10 at night went into the ward and the, the nurse had got Ezra next to me and she said um right I'll come back in about an hour then she says if you want to feed him and do his nappy and get him get him ready then um I'll, I'll pop back in an hour I'll give you some time and obviously I must have still been a bit out of it and I was like all oh, right okay no worries I lay in this room, Verity, and I thought, okay, yeah, right, okay, so I've got this little thing next to me that's currently asleep, I don't know how to change a nappy, no. I don't know how to pick him up, I don't know how to feed him, I've got a bottle here, but how much am I supposed to give him, how am I supposed to hold him, yeah. um, what if he chokes or cough I, I just went into panic mode mm. and I didn't know how to do the most basic of things that I think are expected of you yeah we as women are expected to know how to change a nappy because yeah. there might have been other kids in your family or you've changed your siblings nappies before yeah. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing and no. Uh, no no clue literally and I'm, I, I panicked and I pressed the panic button which is ridiculous thinking back now because I change about 10 nappies a day. But at the time, <laughs> I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, yeah. I literally had no, and in that moment, I felt really, really scared. Um, and for everything you can watch on One Born Every Minute, all these stories you hear of women, it was in that moment that I felt really isolated. And I mm -hmm. thought, I feel embarrassed that I've got to press this button and say, like I know this sounds really like what's it but do do I can can I touch his willy mm -hmm. like when I'm cleaning him um uh, what if I hurt him like I don't, I don't know what to do like yeah. I, and I was like doing it like as if he was a doll kind of yeah. thing yeah. I, just, and I think I mean it, it, it is scary I think it's scary for for everybody but it's like what do you think could have helped in that time that somebody had walked you through it or or do you think there's more education that's needed before you actually give birth what's what would have helped yeah I mean I guess I, I look at things pragmatically and I appreciate that I probably would have been able to have gone to antenatal classes which were taken away from me which I didn't have the opportunity to yeah. go you know partner couldn't come to any scans um everything I did was on my own so I suppose there was an element of um fear 
being built up in me over a period of nine months to this particular yeah. day because everything I've done so far was on my own. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I as a mum with no experience or no support because of the pandemic got a lot of stuff off the internet. So mm. I learned a lot of things off the internet. Now, for as much as that's great, it's also not great because everybody has their own opinion. These groups, you know, the, the forums that you're encouraged to join and sign up to, one person asks a question and everyone's like a pack of wolves on them if they don't say the right thing. So how was I ever going to go on there and put what I was actually feeling? Mm -hmm. Because I was being trolled. Yeah. And, and so for those reasons, I've stayed clear of them. I, I just think that maybe the nurse shouldn't have assumed that I was just like every other mum on the ward. Yeah. And I think I appreciate time is a big issue within any area of the NHS. I appreciate that, that they are running a protocol just as we are in our everyday lives with our jobs. But each woman has got a story. Every woman yes. is individual in, in what they do, you know, and, and maybe there should have been a little bit more understanding that I don't know, is there even like a red, amber, green system? Did I come under the amber? It's not a high risk because I'm obviously under the influence or anything like that, but I'm amber because I don't know what I'm doing. And, yeah. you know, yes, I've had an elective cesarean, but did anyone, anyone actually look at why? Yeah. And, and did I, did somebody just say, do you need us to stay with you, Bianca? Are you okay? Yeah. Um, then just say, right, I'll come back in an hour. I'll leave you to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's that one size fits all thing that seems to get yeah. applied, isn't it? And, and that, talking to a lot of people, it's, um, you know, women, we all, we all, all different. Our experiences will be different in all aspects of, of kind of women's health as well. And we shouldn't, there shouldn't be this one size fits all. There needs to be a more in-depth conversation mm -hmm. with, with the woman to understand what her needs actually are. So Definitely. yeah, so that's really good. One other thing I just wanted to touch on is obviously you are a business owner. You've mm -hmm. started this and like you said, you know, found out two weeks later that you were, you were pregnant. What's been the biggest challenge or what learned as well would you give to new mums that are actually you know running their own businesses um so for me it's a huge positive because um I get to be at home and I don't have the fear and worry that I know a lot of mums and friends of mine have where they know that impending day is coming where they've got to go back to work and yeah. back to work as in into the workplace. Um, I've not had that and I haven't got that. So as a business owner, it's so empowering to know that I don't have this D-Day coming where I've got to okay. go back to work. Um, I guess for that reason as well, it's meant that I can plan my day around my son the best that I can you know my partner he works from home as well and we're completely 50 50 contributors towards looking after him um, and he he has his own business too so it means that I haven't got that worry of him going out to work and me not being able to run my business I guess one of the things I've become a master of is becoming a night owl so in the day, um, I do what I need to do, you know, Zoom calls, et cetera. But I've become a master of when he goes to bed, you know, we have some partner time and, you know, we do watch a, a movie, have, have a meal or whatever. But I work then. That's my work okay. time. My day yeah. kind of begins when he goes to bed because that's un uninterrupted time that I'm not getting annoyed because I've just started something and I've got to go and stop. Um, I think if I was to look at the, the downsides of it, probably the financial side is the most um, challenging because yeah. starting a new business and having an additional mouth to feed and, yeah. and you know, somebody else in the house that is demanding of your time, um, I, I know I haven't got that guaranteed paycheck yeah. coming in every month. So as, as what I'll call a fledgling business owner, I'm still in startup phase. And startup yeah. phase for me will probably go on for the, for the next two years. You know, it's not really until year three that I see myself as an established brand. Yeah. Um, that can be challenging because for any woman in general versus a woman business owner, I've got a million ideas going on in my head that I want to generate. I want to be speaking to people. I want to get out there and tell everybody about what I do. Yeah have to accept that that's not a, possible, a possibility when you are a new mum. Yeah, because um, until he goes to nursery or um, until he's in a better position with his sleeping pattern, 
I haven't got that nine to five yeah. sort of mentality. I'm having to sort of balance the two. Um, yeah. I, I owe a lot of that to my partner. I think, it, you know, I, I absolutely have a newfound respect for single mums. Um, I don't know how they do it. I really, really don't, you know. So I, my, my respect level for mums who have to look after kids on their own is just inspiring to me. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'd have been able to have gotten through the well-being side, bringing up Ezra and continuing to grow my business without yeah. that support of him. So yeah, it's it's um, behind every man is a good woman. I'm going to flip that on on this, <laughs> in this one because yeah, I, I stand for myself, but a, a lot of what I am doing is from the support yeah. of him. So oh, amazing. that's lovely, and and I think that's very much underestimated because it's the same in my house. I could yeah. not do what I do without the support of my husband yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. and that's a really really lovely message to to end on I think yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so thank you so much for for letting me interview you for Switch It mm-hmm. Up and um I will speak to you soon thank you pleasure Gaff. thank you Verity thank, thank you, you. Cheers.